In this week's video, we'll cover numerous 2019 setups and signals and place them in historical context to help us understand why history says stocks could rocket higher over the next two years. It's extremely important to note that this video covers longer term signals and probabilities, even if stocks move higher over the next two years, which is to be determined, we must have realistic expectations regarding red days, red weeks, and red months. Longer term odds covered in this video tell us very little about shorter term outcomes. Always have to keep in mind that volatility is a normal part of all trends. Before we get started with the new data, it's helpful to understand what we have been doing and what we will be doing this week. This is from the January 4th, 2019 video. This slide basically showed one, two, three items that occurred the week of January 4th that basically told us to keep an open mind about the market making a bottom or forming a bottom, which leverages this extremely important concept from market wizards that we've covered in the past. Technical analysis or the use of charts and hard data tracks the past. It does not predict the future. You have to use your own intelligence to draw conclusions about what the past activity of some traders may say about the future activity of other traders. The past activity of some traders, that's what's reflected in the hard data and on the charts that we cover each week. The historical studies allow us to place that hard data into the proper context, allowing us to better understand what past activity may say about future actions of other human beings. Here's another example from a February 19th, 2019 post. The post covers something that we could see and measure that occurred in 2019. The historical study allows us to understand what it might mean going forward. This is a slide from the April 5th, 2019 video where we recapped numerous studies that leverage these important concepts. You can find a recap of 2019 research by Googling this title here, finding this paragraph in this post and using these links here. S&P 500 daily chart dated July 10th, 2019. For the most part, 365 days a year, we can always find calls that say something like this. We need a 10% pullback. We may indeed get a 10% pullback in July of 2019, but we have to keep in mind, we just experienced a 10% correction in early 2018. Basically a 20% bear market in 2018 if this was a 20 number, would that make this a bear market? By definition, it would, which means basically from a psychological and retracement perspective, we just had a bear market. And in May of this year, we just had a fairly significant retracement of this move here, which totaled 6.84%. You may remember it was very, very popular to label this as a bearish head and shoulders pattern. We talked about the possibility of a right shoulder forming back in January of this year. This fits the psychological profile of an inverse head and shoulders pattern with a left shoulder, a head and a right shoulder. The shallow right shoulder tells us for the most part, this is probably selling that includes institutions on the left side of the head. This is selling that is mainly driven by retail investors. Fear, a higher spike in fear, and then a lower spike in fear. For the most part, if we look at the chart of the S&P 500 from 2017 to the present day, 
We had a big run up here in a market that needed to consolidate its gains. How do we know we're in consolidation? If we can draw horizontal lines and hit price multiple times, this is confusion and or consolidation. It's indecisiveness in the battle between the bulls and the bears. History tells us that it's in the realm of possibility that this is a bullish trend this is consolidation to digest the gains. This is a bullish breakout, possibly might continue the bullish trend if the breakout holds. Fractals tell us that consolidation after a move can take many forms. This consolidation here in the 1940s and early 1950s looks more like the 1987 crash where the consolidation occurs below the prior high. But the concepts are still the same. The market needs to consolidate its gains. It goes sideways. This is indecisiveness, a bullish breakout, and then the prior trend continues. Similar situation here, 1949 to 1956, gains, consolidation, and gains. 1959, a big move. The market needs to consolidate its gains, a bullish breakout, and a continuation of the prior trend. Is it possible? that this consolidation and sideways movement can result in a reversal and a bearish breakdown? Absolutely, positively, yes. But in this case, it was resolved to the upside and good things happened. Here's a real world example where the consolidation is a reversal pattern. The market falls, consolidates, and in this case, we get a bullish breakout. It's possible in this case that this would have been consolidation for a downtrend and we would have continued the trend in this direction. The reversal pattern after sideways movement tells us we always have to keep an open mind to all outcomes. In this case, the consolidation resolved to the upside and really good things happened. This is why studying history is so important. History helps us understand the probabilities relative to sideways movement like this in the present day that occurred after substantial gains. Similar pattern in the 80s. A big move off of a low consolidation, a bullish breakout, big gains again in the same direction relative to the trend that was in place prior to the consolidation. Sometimes the patterns are messier, the concepts are the same. Big move, market consolidates its gains, is confused, resolution to the upside with a new high, good things happen. We can find this pattern on one minute charts, 60 minute charts, daily charts, weekly charts, monthly charts, quarterly charts, and that's the concept of fractals. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Once again, gains, consolidation, a bullish breakout. Here's a retest and then a continuation of the trend that was in place. We have a tendency to see the same patterns over and over again in various but similar forms. It's part of the definition of a fractal, similar, not identical. Why are we seeing these patterns over and over again? Because greed and fear was exactly the same in human beings in 1993 as it is in 2019. So in terms of probabilities going forward, let's use our own intelligence. It's important we have to be willing to think. Let's use our intelligence to draw conclusions about what the past activity of some traders may say about the future activity of other traders. And hopefully the studies that we're going to cover next will help us better understand the probability of a bullish breakout relative to a bearish breakdown. We have a lot to cover, so I apologize. We're going to have to move rapidly. This is a breath momentum oscillator. We're looking at data between 1981 and the present day. This is the reading of the oscillator on February 20th, 2019. Just glancing at this chart, this is a relatively rare and elevated level. How rare? Rising to the blue line from below the blue line has only occurred six previous 
times over the past 13,921 calendar days. This is basically another example of a breath thrust. And we're not simply looking at momentum here. This tells us a lot, an incredible amount, about the interpretation of all the fundamentals on all time frames relative to the net aggregate opinion of all market participants. We don't get a move like this without something changing in the perception basically of institutions. It's extremely rare to get down to this green line and it's extremely rare to get up to the blue line. We hit the green line in late 2018 and the blue line on February 20th, 2019. If you've been in the markets for years and been studying charts, you know that powerful messages can be given via extremely rare events. And as we move forward, this is going to be one example of that concept. There's a reason why these are rare events. It's not very often that the market gets spooked in a way that will move this indicator down to the green line. And it's not very often that something changes rapidly, causing the indicator to move from the green line all the way up to a rare level represented by the blue line. So let's take these six dates that are similar to February 20th, 2019 and address the million dollar question. What happened next in the stock market? In short, the answer is good things. You could even say very good things in some cases. This chart helps us understand something that just happened, the actions of some traders. These charts allow us to use our own intelligence to draw conclusions about what the past activity of some traders may say about the future activity of other traders. And keep in mind, these are the only cases that have similar movements to February 20th, 2019 over a period spanning almost 14,000 calendar days. The average gain 245, median gain 161 after the dates that were similar to February 20th, 2019, the average duration of the rally, roughly seven and a half years, simply telling us to keep an open mind about much better than expected outcomes in the years ahead. Similar situation here. Another breath indicator looks at the NYSE, the percent of stocks at a new 52 week high. December 2018, an extremely rare oversold reading. I assure you, if you study charts, when you hear the term extremely rare, we should pay attention. Indicator dropped below half a percent and then rallied strongly, this is your breath thrust, to above 16%, and that just occurred on June 21st of this year, just a few weeks ago. Let's look at a broader view to put the move that we've seen in the past few months in a broader historical context. Keeping in mind, powerful messages can be given via extremely rare events. A similar move has only occurred four previous times, and we're looking at all the data. This is all the data available for this indicator. We're not cherry picking cases. We're not leaving them out to understand what this past activity of some traders may say about the future activity of other traders. It might be helpful to know what happened next in these cases, similar to the present day. Here are the four similar periods in history. Here's S&P 500 performance looking out 30 days all the way out to 10 years. Is it a small sample size? Absolutely, positively, yes. And there's a little blurb at the end of the video using some common sense 
about small sample sizes. If the small sample size concerns you, there's a very, very easy solution. Simply ignore the analysis. I've been doing this a long time. It's very, very rare that you will produce a chart that looks anything like this chart here. It's important to keep in mind, these dates are similar to June 21st, 2019. Therefore, we didn't arbitrarily pick these dates. They share something very unique and rare with the present day. Anything else that's happening in the present day that helps us track the past activity of one set of traders to help us better understand and use our intelligence to assess probabilities about what other traders may do in the future? The answer is yes. S&P 500 monthly. Notice the word trying is in red here. This is a monthly chart. On July 10th at 11.42 a.m., we have a bullish cross on monthly MACD. We have no idea if we will have a bullish cross on monthly MACD on July 31st, 2019, hence the red type here. Given everything we know today, the odds seem reasonable that sometime in the next few weeks or months, we most likely will see a bullish MACD cross. That's a statement based on odds. We just have to see how it plays out. And before we go any further, did we ever see something like this during the devastating dot-com bear market or the devastating financial crisis bear market? The answer is no. The S&P 500 peaks in March of 2000, and you can see once it rolls over, black stays below red. The same thing can be said here. The S&P 500 peaks in early to mid-October. We get the bearish cross never get a bullish cross during the entire bear market. How is this potentially helpful? The peak to trough loss in this bear market in the S&P 500 was 49%. And the equivalent decline from peak to trough on a closing basis was almost 57%. If this bullish cross remains in place at the end of the month in July of 2019, Black will have been below red for 273 calendar days. And we know from past videos, when we get this bearish cross here, but we're above the center line, that speaks to odds that this decline is a counter trend move within the context of an existing uptrend. Those odds flip when we drop below the center line. So this is telling us the odds of the counter trend move being over and the primary trend reestablishing itself are improving. Thus, it's helpful to know how many times has a similar shift, an intermediate term momentum shift, taken place? Answer, since 1949, there have been 33 monthly MACD bearish crosses like this followed by a bullish cross like this, with the duration of the bearish cross lasting between 28 days and 1,215 days. Of the 33 cases, there were seven cases similar to this type of move and duration. Seven of the cases lasted between 200 and 400 calendar days, which is important because 28 calendar days is 10 times shorter. It's not really fair to say that sentiment and asset class movement and portfolio shifts would be the same over 273 calendar days relative to the damage and shifts that would take place over 1,215 calendar days. Thus, it's important to match the duration it speaks to the magnitude of the problem and the damage and asset class shifts that take place between point A and point B. What happened next in the stock market in the seven cases dating back to 1949? We're looking at every single 
case that's similar to the present day. Here are the seven cases, the bear cross, the bull cross, the duration of the bear cross, which is similar to where we are in 2019. And this is what happened next in the S&P 500 over the next 30 days to five years. Once again, telling us to keep an open mind about much, the possibility of much better than expected outcomes in the short run, intermediate run, and long run. These losses here 90 days out also tell us to keep an open mind about short-term volatility and or some disappointment even under a bullish outcome. You may have seen this tweet in the CCM Twitter feed. Let's look at a chart that helps us understand the following. How rare was the sell-off in the S&P 500 in Q4 of 2018? And B, how significantly did the Fed misjudge the messages from the credit and equity markets in December of 2018? This is an NYSE oscillator showing the rate of change of declining issues on the NYSE. Once again, a breath indicator. We're looking at data going back to 1982, a very, very long time. Here's the reading in February of this year. Extremely rare. Similar move has only occurred 16 previous times. And similar to what happened recently, in each case, there was something fundamentally that spooked market participants. This helps us understand and track the net aggregate opinion of all market participants related to all subjects, all fundamentals on all time frames. How significant and rare was the sprint for the exits in this recent episode? This reading here is lower and more severe than the reading here following the 1987 Black Monday stock market crash. And in this case, we have somewhat of an irrational exuberance spike to the upside before this plunge. We really don't have anything like that over here. Telling us once again, what happened in Q4 of 2018 was extremely rare and it was a very low probability event. It's our job to be prepared for all possible outcomes. This chart here is part of the bird strike project, and I can unequivocally say that we are in much, much better shape going forward to deal with difficult situations. Not claiming that we can predict difficult situations. Simply saying that we can deal with them better in real time, looking at hard data. And as we noted earlier, can get a tremendous amount of good information when something extremely rare happens in the stock market. Thus, to help us better understand what the past activity of some market participants may tell us about the future activity of other market participants, it'd be helpful to know in these 16 cases, this is the 17th case here, what happened next in the stock market. Here are the dates of the 16 cases with the readings similar to February 28th of 2019. And here is the performance in the S&P 500 looking out 30 days to five years. Should be noted, the signal in the present day came on February 28th, 2019. That's 134 calendar days ago when we're looking back from July, meaning we've already gone through this portion of the table and it's this portion of the table that's more relevant in the present day. And market action, S&P 500 action over the first 90 days in the present day case seemed to align pretty well with the table. It's a mixed bag here. And over the first 90 days after the signal, the S&P 500 was basically flat. 
was down by 0.05%, similar to this case here and similar to many of these cases with somewhat of a yellow look in the table. Thus, the important thing for us relative to the probability of good things happening in the future is this portion of the table. The S&P 500 closed at 2784 on February 28th of this year. If we experienced the average gain relative to these historical cases, a year from now we'd be at 3275, two years 3687, then 3968, 4303, and 4764 with the average gain being 17, 32, 42, 54, and 71. And an impressive 100%, 100%, 94%, 93%, and 93% of these 16 cases in this area here, looking out one to five years, produced positive results in the S&P 500, which simply speaks to the probability of good things happening in the present day looking out one to five years relative to the probability of bad things happening. And as the 1998 case shows, the probability of bad things happening is never zero, especially when we look out three to five years. Notice what we're doing in this week's video is no different than what we did on January 4th. And it's basically the same approach that we used on February 19th. Is there anything else? that can help us with these concepts here. It's possible when we covered this chart earlier in the video, spanning 1982 to 1987, that you thought to yourself, that's wonderful, Chris, but we really don't have anything in common in the present day with this period here. Let's address those concerns. All of the periods that we covered earlier in the video were not chosen arbitrarily. This is one of the seven cases that we just covered with the extremely rare intermediate term MACD bull cross on the monthly chart. Also similar to the present day. In the present day, the bull cross is trying to form and get nailed down in the present day as we are trying to break out of this long-term consolidation box. It's basically exactly what happened in this case here. And in this case here, we also have a Fed rate cut in this area here. We didn't arbitrarily pick this case. As the market moved off of this low following this consolidation period, it nailed down the very, very rare monthly MACD cross that we just covered. So this period here, is this period here at the top of this table we just covered. The same thing can be said for this case that we showed at the beginning of the video. You get the rare MACD cross, only happens seven other times. It basically coincides with the attempt to break out of the long-term consolidation box. Very, very similar to the setup that's trying to form in the present day. Another similarity here. We also have a Fed rate cut here, very, very similar to what the market is expecting at the end of July 2019. Didn't arbitrarily pick this period. Very, very similar to what's trying to happen in the present day. As price is trying to successfully break above the long-term consolidation box, the S&P 500's monthly chart nails down the monthly MACD cross that is trying to form in the present day. This period here in 1961 is this period here in the table that we covered previously. Anything else in this period that's similar to the present day? Yes, the Fed was cutting rates here just as the MACD cross was forming and price was trying to break out of the long-term consolidation box. When we look at this level of detail, we see that chart patterns, MACD crosses, and Fed policy, there's similarities between these historical cases and the present day. How about the case where the consolidation pattern was a reversal pattern? 
MACD cross comes in this area here, and then good things happened. It was also a Fed rate cut in relatively close proximity. How about the consolidation period that occurred in 1990 and 1991? Once again, very, very similar to the present day. The MACD cross comes here and is nailed down just as price is attempting to clear the long-term consolidation box. In the present day, we're attempting to clear the long-term consolidation box and we're trying to nail down a similar and rare MACD cross. Also noteworthy, in this area here, the Fed is cutting rates, providing economic stimulus, which undoubtedly helped the market clear what was previously an unsurmountable level here. Three similarities between this period here and the present day, which simply speaks to probabilities. How about the consolidation that took place between 1993 and early 1995? Unbelievably, the rare MACD cross comes in close proximity to the bullish breakout attempt from the long-term consolidation box and the Fed cuts rates for the first time here in July after a rate increase in February of that year. First rate cut in a new cycle as price is breaking out of the long-term consolidation box and the cut comes soon after the rare MACD cross went into the history books. After all of that, good things happened. Thus, we have chart patterns, Fed activity, and MACD crosses that apply for the most part, to almost every single one of these historical cases. Thus, what we're doing here every week, we're looking at new data and we continually test the bullish hypothesis that was slowly formed as the data improved in Q1 of 2019. Let's continue to do that with present day data using these concepts. Once again, this is something that just happened in July of 2019. Similar concepts will move quickly. NASDAQ 100% of stocks and the NASDAQ 100 above their 150 day moving average. Extremely rare, oversold, sprint for the exits type activity. And notice right here, this is the Fed significantly misreading the message from the equity market, the equity market's been sending a message to the Fed from this period to this period. The credit market's sending a message to the Fed from this period to this period. The Fed did not listen and it resulted in a 20% drawdown in the S&P 500. The Fed came to their senses here and things reversed quickly. Is the Fed the only reason for this and this? Absolutely, positively, no. But as we've covered before, you can chronicle Powell's comments and align them with the S&P 500 and see a very direct correlation. Fed doesn't give the market what it wants here. The Fed flip-flops early in 2019 and everything changes. This is a sharp reversal of this here where Powell basically signaled to the market that the Fed put was O-V-E-R. When he retracted that, the market responded. Let's zoom out. Here's the move in 2018. You can see the sprint for the exits was worse than 2016, 2015, and even worse than 2011. Let's look at all the cases. We have data going back to 2002. We're looking at all the data. How many times has it happened and what happened next in the stock market? Unbelievably, it's only happened three previous times dating back to 2002. And this is what happened next in the S&P 500. It's very, very difficult to say that this table here contradicts the hypothesis that we've been covering over the past few months. At some point, 
In these videos, we are going to start producing tables with a lot more yellow and a lot more red out here. When will that happen? We have absolutely positively no idea. Take it day by day and week by week relative to this research. Another odd reading on a breath indicator here. This is the lowest reading since August 31st, 1982. When extremely rare things happen, it's the market's way of saying it's time to pay attention. Similar situation and message from the NASDAQ summation index, a measure of market breadth. Extremely rare reading here, end of February 2019. We're looking at all the data. Data starts here in 1998. You can see here only two other times have we moved above the blue line. May 30th, 2003, July 31st, 2013. What happened next in the stock market? May 30th, 2003, S&P 500. The answer is good things happened for a long period of time. July 31st, 2013, similar and extremely rare reading in the summation index, similar to a reading that we could see and measure in 2019. This tells us something about the action of some market participants. This tells us something about the action of some market participants in the present day. This is an extremely rare reading, a rare reading and a rare reading again. What happened next in the stock market in this case? S&P 500 here, here's the signal. Notice, bad things happened right off the bat, reminding us that we have to have realistic expectations about what could happen over the next 30 to 90 to 180 days, even under bullish outcomes longer term. And we always have to have realistic expectations about volatility. Red days, red weeks, red months, and even red quarters are 100% normal and to be expected. Human beings, all of us, have a tendency to see a table like this, and then when the market's red on Monday, we'll just discount it and say, well, that must be wrong. When we think that through, we know that's ridiculous. Of course, there's going to be red days, red weeks, red months, and even red quarters, even under this type of scenario. We can't execute properly without realistic expectations. So even after the signal here, this is a little dose of reality that lasted several weeks. What happened next? S&P rallied for 22 months and tacked on an additional 26.4%. What about small sample sizes? You can find this blurb on our blog, Short Takes, you can pause your video player and read it. Let's say hypothetically you had $600,000 that you were thinking of investing with a money manager. And let's assume, hypothetically, you asked a money manager, is this a good time to invest some cash? Our response, based on our approach, your approach may differ significantly would be yes, here's why. When we're near this base here, we have a very good reference point relative to risk and reward. If we move away from the base and the data still looks good, we can feather money in at a reasonable rate. Hypothetically, if you feathered in here and the breakout fails, this reference point is still helpful because it's the market's way of telling you you should be in no rush to take the remainder of the cash off the sidelines. Again, we're speaking in hypothetical terms here. Unfortunately, experience and human nature say instead of cash being invested and new accounts being opened here near the base, Human nature says, well, let's see what happens. Trying to invest cash here is harder. It is higher risk when you're extended from the base. We have absolutely positively no idea what the future holds, 
but we can confidently assess the probabilities based on the facts that we have in hand today. And realistically, one of the best ways to answer that question would be to phrase it or ask it in another manner. Have you been putting any of your own money to work in the present day? The answer is yes, for the reasons just discussed. How long that process continues, we have no idea. Take it day by day. You may argue, what about the fundamentals? Keep in mind, these charts are a reflection of the interpretation of all the fundamentals, every single topic you can think of covering every single time frame. Having said that, it's still helpful to monitor some fundamental data directly. We've covered the relevance of credit spreads in detail in recent weeks. If we look at spreads this week, better, worse, or about the same? The answer is better. We've also talked about in detail how these concepts apply to the high yield bond market. A quote from the top high yield manager, the rally in risky corporate debt is far from over, which speaks to the perception of default risk, which also bridges to the perception or the probability in the minds of market participants relative to a recession. The rally in risky corporate debt is far from over. And he attributes that to low inflation. You can find the article, Bloomberg article, by Googling this title here. I'm gonna move through these quickly. You can pause your video player to look at them in more detail. If you can't see the Twitter handles, you can Google these names with Twitter after it and you should be able to find their Twitter feeds. This tweet and chart basically says the present day has something in common with 2016, something that we've been covering for weeks in these videos. Remember earlier we said the shallow right shoulder speaks to institutional support. They are not the ones doing the selling here for the most part. Always believe it's helpful to hear the same message from other sources. The S&P 500 tweet on the right has not had one week of distribution since the beginning of 2019, which speaks to lack of institutional selling. Once again, you can pause your player. If global bond yields are at a record low, you can make an argument that they're also at the highest risk level than they've ever been before. If rates are near zero and at a record or all time low globally, they basically in the long run have nowhere to go but up. And that means bond prices in the long run have nowhere to go but down. Doesn't speak to the short run or the intermediate run. Obviously, yields can continue to fall but here, you're not near the zero bound. Remember in 2016, when we got near the zero bound and some rates went negative, this dynamic reversed in many markets. Once again, simply speaks to hard evidence and probabilities. Similar concepts here with these charts. I'll let you use the pause button. Sentiment trader, you can read the tweet. The fourth largest outflow since 2007 from equity mutual funds. Here's one that exceeds it. Good things happen in the stock market after that. Here's one that's similar. Good things happen in the stock market after that. Exceeds it near a major low in the stock market. This might be the one notable exception, but you have to ask yourself, does this look here align with anything that we've covered in this week's video? or in past weeks. If this were the higher probability outcome, instead of getting a look like this where momentum is improving and the monthly chart is making a new all-time high, we would expect to see a weak momentum look similar to this look here and this look here. And we would expect to see new lower lows in the S&P 500 on the monthly chart. That absolutely positively may happen, but that's almost the polar opposite of what we have on July 10th, 2019. 
Let's double back to a concept that we've covered numerous times in the past. And until you understand and embrace this concept, it's going to be almost next to impossible to properly use technical analysis and hard data, especially near major lows. For the most part, at any major low, it will seem intuitively impossible given the current environment in the aftermath of the low for the market to go up for that long a period of time. The takeaway is the market has a history. It always feels that way of doing the seemingly impossible. We only learn the why after the move, not before. And realistically, that confidence only comes with experience and or very intent and detailed studies of historical cases, allowing us to leverage these concepts. The market is expecting a rate cut at the end of July and possibly more before the end of the year. We've already covered the historical implications of that. We've covered the yield curve numerous times. It's still, the long end of the curve is still not close to inverting. And we've said numerous times that a big spike in unemployment claims and or the unemployment rate would be concerning. This week, initial claims decreased, telling us that there's really nothing new on that front. Here's some additional excellent data relative to Fed rate cuts and subsequent stock market performance from LPL and Ryan Dietrich. You can pause your video player and or visit Ryan's Twitter feed to find this tweet. And you can click on the chart in the tweet to make it large. Basically says, has the Fed cut rates with stocks being near new highs? The answer is yes. And good things for the most part have happened historically. I think it's fair to say the information that we've covered this week and the information that we've covered in recent months tells us to remain open to the possibility of a successful breakout and move in this direction. Under our approach, none of this works if we don't wake up every day with that flexible, unbiased and open mind, allowing us to reassess the probabilities as new data comes to light. It may also be worth a visit to the new website to see the FAQs. We've got new and expanded FAQs covering traditional investing, low cost passive investing, and the online slash robo strategies that are currently in vogue. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice and Shivako Capital Management LLC or CCM is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.